So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today in uh, the first of our 2022 Pavement Preservation Education webinars. We're happy to have you with us here today, and, and we're going to talk today about crack treatments. I think one of the most, if not the most, cost-effective pavement preservation tools we can have in our pavement preservation toolboxes, and I think really a basic building block of any well-functioning pavement management system. So while we're waiting for a few stragglers to join us, um, I think I'd like to go ahead and start off with our first poll question, uh, just to get a, a, a feel for where our attendees are coming from today. So if you could just take a second to answer that, this question here, I'd appreciate it. And we'll share the results with everyone here in a minute, as soon as we have them in. Just a couple more seconds here to see what the results are. And while we're waiting for those to come in, why don't we uh, move on? Oh, there's our polling results right there. Wow, we have almost 100% of our uh, audience members today come from the municipal uh, public works uh, space of our industry. So that's good to know. So we, that's exactly the kind of audience we wanted to speak to today. And again, we, we thank you for being here. Um, just before we get started talking about crack treatments, we wanted to make sure you were all aware of past webinars that we conducted. In, in 2021, we did these three webinars you see here on the screen. In March, we did microsurfacing and cape seals. In April, we did cold in place recycling. And then later in, the, in June, we did fog seals and rejuvenators. If you miss those and any of those treatments are toxic topics of interest for you, you can find recordings of those webinars on our YouTube channel, which is Indus Roads, as you see there in the bottom of the screen. And this year in 2022, aside from today's webinar on, on crack treatments, uh, we're planning one later this fall, maybe early this winter, on this newest treatment offering that we have here at Indus. And, and it's a mouthful, as you see here on screen. It's paver laid, foamed asphalt stabilized, full depth reclamation or FDR as we commonly refer to it. Um, most of the FDR that's happening in the New England marketplace right now is not paver laid. It's typically laid out in a windrow behind the recycling machine and then graded around. So pretty disruptive to traffic in neighborhoods. Uh, we'll be laying our recycled FDR layer through a big Vogelie paver designed to lay big, thick, heavy mats like that. And also most of the FDR currently going on is not stabilized. Some people will put a little calcium chloride or magnesium chloride in primarily for dust control. Our intention is to stabilize that recycle layer by adding a combination of foamed asphalt cement and Portland cement, just like we do with our cold in place recycling to create a much stronger recycle layer. So. We're gonna be doing a couple of those jobs this year. We'll be collecting uh, images and video and photo to share with everybody. We'll put it all together in a webinar for you later this year, as I said. Uh, just one more poll question before we jump into our agenda here. We'd like to get a feel uh, for everybody uh, regarding your community. Is crack sealing a part of your regular program? And most of our audience is from an agency. So we'd like you to answer this question uh, from you, for the town that you work in, not the town you live in. So please just take a second to let us know uh, how, how often you do crack sealing as part of your program in your community right now. And again, we'll share those results for you here in a bit as soon as we have them. While we're waiting for those results to come in, why don't we just get started uh, by me giving you an overview of what our program looks like today. Today, so we've we've accumulated quite a bit of information that we hope you'll find information hope you'll find helpful. And here's how we plan to share it with you today. Uh, I like to start off by just answering this basic threshold question: uh, Why should you care? Why is crack sealing important to your road network? What's in it for you and your constituents? Just the basic uh, foundation of why we should. Uh, make sure that we have crack seal in our pavement management toolboxes. Then our QC manager, Matt Tito is gonna join us and he's gonna talk about 
uh, an area that we probably get the most questions on when it comes to crack treatments, and that's what material should I use and what methodology for in installation. So he's going to take a fairly deep dive into that topic and share that information with everybody. And then he's also going to touch on a handful of really critical aspects of the installation process that uh, are crucial to getting a good quality job. Um, and then we're going to visit a job site. Uh, our original intention uh, was to go out and shoot live video from a website. But while we were out there uh, doing a practice run, uh, we realized that there's a lot of things that are uncontrollable, unpredictable out on live, drive, live, live job sites that um, kind of scared us aside from the technological challenges. So we decided to record a video from the job site. We're going to share that with you here today. Uh, then we have one of our clients who's been a crack seal client for gosh, probably seven or eight years now in a couple of different communities. Uh, his name is Kevin McCabe. He's the relatively new public works director for the town of Dover, Massachusetts. He's going to join us and be interviewed by my colleague, Alan Bile to answer questions regarding his experience with crack sealing. Then I will conclude our presentation by sharing with you some of the ways that I think Indus is different than other crack sealing contractors. And then we'll take as much time as you'd like answering your questions to the best of our ability uh, at the end. So feel free to submit those questions as we go along. Do we want them to use the Q&A? Is that the proper way? Yeah, so please use the, the Q&A box to um, submit your questions and we're gonna answer them all at the end. I think it'll probably be the easiest way to do that. So I just got the poll results popped up in front of me here regarding the, uh, how often your communities crack seal. And it's, it's great news. Uh, about half of the attendees are saying they crack seal every year. That's, that's the answer I'm shooting for. And then um, 45% say every few years and just a small fraction, less than 10% say rarely. So our goal will be to get these rarelys to do crack sealing uh, more often. I think, as I said, it's a critical building block in any good pavement management program. Um, and really, uh, I think it's something that probably most communities should be doing every year. So without any further ado, let's, let's jump into that first, that first topic area I mentioned, which is why, why crack seal? What, what, why, why should we care? And, and the, the most obvious and, and um, common sense reason why we crack seal is to keep water uh, out of our pavement structures. Absolutely critical for good roads to keep water out of our pavement structures. You know, and I, I started in the public works industry as a public works director back in 1992 uh, in the town of Walkill, which is in Orange County, New York. And, and I had come from the private sector where we had been shop, building shopping centers. So I'd had the opportunity to build some new roads in and out of the shopping centers, but suddenly I was tasked in my new role as public works director to take care of maintaining. In my town, we had 165 miles. So I didn't know anything about maintaining roads. So I was always looking for, to take classes, to learn about what I needed to know in that position. And one of the first classes I took was this one called Basics of a Good Road. It was offered by the Cornell Local Roads Program, which is New York's uh, technology transfer center. And I'll, I'll always remember the instructor stood up at the beginning of the class and said, we've got a full day ahead of us covering all the content in this 50, 60, 60 page manual here. But before we get started, I'm going to give you the three most important things you know need to know as it relates to uh, good roads. And he went to the chalkboard and he wrote down drainage drainage and drainage. And, and for those of you that are with us today that have been in this industry for any amount of time at all, you quickly realize that uh, drainage is key. You can't have good roads without good drainage. And, and really when we think about our roads, there's a typical cross section of a road. Sometimes we uh, lose sight of all the different directions or ways in which water is attacking our pavements. You know, well, I think we oftentimes think about water coming in from the sides of the roads, particularly where we have the uh, adjacent ground next to the road higher than the road. Uh, typically, we try to get some drainage ditches in there or some under drains or a closed drainage system. You know, we know just allowing that water to flow onto the pavement or flow uh, and try to get under the pavement is not good. Sometimes, although not as prevalent in this part of the country as other parts of the country, groundwater is an issue, but uh, 
uh, that capillary action of any water under the pavements is, is a big problem in our winter time and it leads to a lot of uh, uh, frost heaves and potholes. But for the purpose of our Praxia webinar today, the water we're most concerned with is that top down water, the rainwater that we really want to get off the pavement just as quickly as we can for safety reasons to avoid hydroplaning. But we also don't want it flowing down through cracks in the pavement structure uh, and, and wreaking havoc underneath our pavements. And, and uh, I love this picture. It's one of those that you just stumble across sometime and you go, wow, that, that's gonna come in handy someday. So I took this picture, you know, maybe nine or 10 years ago. It was on a golf, car, golf course, actually. The, the course was closed for the winter. It was coming up on spring. We were walking up a little incline here and up ahead of us was a pile of snow in the cart path that was melting and the water was running down the cart path and into this open unsealed crack. Uh, not a big deal, of course, on a golf cart path uh, in the middle of the winter, not getting any kind of traffic at all, but certainly a, be a much bigger deal if that was a road subjected to uh, lots and lots of car and truck traffic. Uh, water underneath pavements is incredibly destructive for lots of different reasons. You know, we have here in the Northeast in, in our subgrades, our native soils have lots of silts and clays in those. We all know that those can be pretty firm when they're dry and provide good structural stability for our roadbeds. But the minute you put water into them, they can become soft, very much yielding and nowhere near as strong as they need to be for traffic. So we don't want that water softening our subgrades. Uh, if enough water is flowing through the pavement quickly enough, it can actually undermine the pavement, wash away some of the fines in our sub-base, sub-grade materials, and leave a void which can ca cause a pothole. And certainly, uh, this is the time of year when we're coming out of winter and into spring, we see uh, the damage that frost heaves can, call us, can, can cause us. So anything we can do to keep that water out from underneath the pavement is a good thing, um, because all of us in this business know from the resident taxpayer's perspective, there's really two big things that they depend on us and our highway departments for. One, they wanna have the snow and ice cleared in the winter, and two, they don't want any potholes. And if you ask me the single best and most cost-effective way to avoid potholes, it would be crack sealing. Uh, and, and researching and, and putting together information for this webinar today, I came across this study that said only 1% of sealed cracks turn into potholes within a three-year time period. And I thought that was, was a pretty powerful statistic. In the same study, that it also said that out in Utah where they conducted that research, 75% of cracks that weren't sealed turned into potholes within that three-year period. I found that one a little hard to believe, although it was a very legitimate study done by some pretty sharp folks. So uh, I'd like to learn more about how they, how they came up with that calculation. But I think uh, unequivocally, we can say, if you want to reduce the amount of potholes in your community, you should have an aggressive and regularly recurring crack sealing program. So that's the first reason why we crack seal. Pretty obvious. I think it's uh, fairly self-intuitive. We, we all understand that. Uh, the second reason, maybe not quite so uh, obvious, is to keep incompressibles out. What do I mean when I say incompressibles? We're talking about things like uh, sand, gravels, road grit, stuff that just gets tracked out onto pavements. And not a big deal when, the, when cracks are filled with a compressible material like a crack sealant, but looks what, look what happens if uh, we don't seal the cracks and we allow those incompressibles, especially in the winter time, to fill up the unsealed cracks. So Matt's gonna touch on it more here in a bit. Uh, this is called a transverse working crack. Uh, they have a tendency to open and close more than longitudinal non-working cracks. So in the winter time, when the cracks are biggest, the, the sheet of pavement either side of the crack shrinks up to its smallest size. We got these fairly wide cracks and they, they, if they're not filled with a compressible sealant, they're gonna fill up with the sands and gravels and grits. Then as the pavement warms in the spring and summer and tries to expand, it can't because of these incompressibles, pavement buckles, additional cracking occurs, and we go from uh, a relatively controllable problem, this crack, to a less controllable problem where lots more cracking and probably potholes along this area. So that's the second reason we want to seal cracks with uh, crack sealing. 
And then third, and really kind of uh, an extension of the first two is we want to extend pavement light. That, that's the business we're all in, whether you're a, a, a public works director or a town engineer or a contractor like us or the consulting engineer working on the pavement management program. We're all in it together to extend pavement life. And we want to do that just as cost effectively as we can. And I don't think there's a, a more cost effective pavement preservation treatment than crack sealing. But for me to make that assertion very cost effectively, I really need to answer two pretty tough questions when it comes to crack sealing. First one here being, how much does it cost? We get asked that question quite often. Uh, the second, how much life extension does the crack sealing treatment provide? So let's tackle them one at a time here real quick. The reason it's hard to answer the question, how much does crack sealing cost, is there's lots and lots of different factors that go into affecting the cost of a crack sealing job. And I'll just share three real quick with you here now. First and foremost is how much cracking are we talking about? Some jobs will do, it might just be a, a center line paving joint that started to open up two or three years after the paving was done. So the crack crew can walk for miles and miles and miles and maybe only get out a few hundred gallons. And in other situations, it's a road that we would normally consider too far down the curve, too cracked up to even be a good crack seal candidate. But when we explain that to our client, they go, I understand, I get it. I'm just trying to put a Band-Aid on this road and keeping it from falling apart, getting all potholed until I can get the money to do the rehab job that I know that I need to do. So severity and extent of cracking, a huge factor on uh, the final dollar per square yard crack field cost of a project. Second is uh, how close are the, the road, roads that we're gonna be crack sealing? Sometimes we'll go to a job and they'll do a, a couple of blocks here, and then we load up the crew and drive a few miles down the road, do another segment of road there, and then drive across town, do another one there. So we're spending a lot of time in non-productive mode going from work area to work area, as opposed to say going into a whole neighborhood or a series of streets and doing all those. Those are much more efficient and therefore less costly to do than when the segments are all spread out. And then lastly, what are the specified materials and methods? And that's the topic that Matt's going to be talking about here momentarily. So I haven't given you an answer yet. If I, if I had to give you one number, kind of the um, average kind of general rule of thumb that we use, I think the vast majority of our work comes in in this range here, 50 to 60 cents a square yard. But there's also a huge, huge variation to that. We've seen projects that come in at less than half that number. So maybe down 20, 25 cents a square yard. And then we've seen jobs come in at over a dollar a square yard. Those really beat up pavements that uh, the towns are just looking to put a Band-Aid on and hold them together. So 50 to 60 is a pretty good rule of thumb you could use, 50 to 60 cents per square yard. And, and while we're on the topic of, of cost, we also get asked, What's the best way to pay for it? And, and these four options listed here are, I think, the most prevalent options in our region. Uh, my favorite is the first one, paying by the gallon. And I think uh, the reason it's my favorite is it's fair. Um, it's fair for both the municipality or the road owner agency and the contractor. Uh, we only get paid for the number of gallons that we put out. And it's easy for the owner agency to oversee. We can simply measure uh, the volume of material or the depth of material in the tank at the start of the day, the end of the day, very simple math to compute the gallons. Um, and then just build in some safeguards in the contract by making sure the contractor doesn't put a big wide over band down or a big thick over band down. And also only crack seals to cracks that are wanted, uh, that the agency wants cra uh, crack sealed. Uh, similarly, you can get paid by the pound, um, very much, very much, um, very similar to getting paid by the gallon. The difference being we, we need to scale, scale the truck at the beginning and end of the day. That works great here in the Braintree area because we have a certified scale in our yard. It gets a little more complex when we're working far away. We got to arrange to have scales nearby. So that's why I'd rather um, just work by the gallon where all we need to do is measure the depth in the tank each day. Uh, seeing some communities preferring a lump sum bid, 
And I think there's pros and cons to that. The pros are is the community knows how much they need to budget as soon as they open their bids and award the contract. So there's not some unknown like there is when you're paying by the gallon, how much it's gonna cost until you're done with the work. The downside is, is I think on lump sum jobs because they're so hard to figure. For us to determine how many, exactly how many gallons of crack seal it's gonna to take to do a job is tough. So typically contractors build in a little conservatism or safety factor into their bid that I think cost communities more money than it would cost them if they paid by the gallon. And then the fourth one here on the list is probably my least favorite, paying by the lineal foot. A uh, few agencies doing that. The, the reason I don't like it is the agency has to have somebody out there with a wheel measuring all the footage of cracks. We have somebody out there. God forbid the two sets of measurements don't match at the end of the day, then we got to measure them again. I would rather take all that measuring time, effort, and money and put it into more gallons of crack. So that's my opinion on, on the best way to pay for crack soon. So the, the second tough question we have to answer aside from costs is how much life extension does this treatment offer? And I think to answer that question, we need to look at the two different types of crack sealing that we're, we're out there doing most days. One we call standalone crack. So that's where the, the road owner agency uh, sees some cracks that need to address. They have no immediate plans to put any kind of surface treatment or overlay or anything on that pavement. And they're looking to buy a few years of life by keeping the water out, keeping the incompressibles out, sealing up the cracks. We call that standalone crack sealing. And then we do crack sealing in advance of our surface treatments. And we almost always, always, always recommend crack sealing ahead of our surface treatments, which, which are things like chip seal. That's what you see going on here in this picture or a cape seal, which is a chip seal followed by a layer of microsurfacing, which is actually what this, this job is. This was for the city of Newton. Oh, probably about four years ago, I think I took this picture. So you can see here, uh, they're, they're putting the first phase of the Cape Seal on the opposite side of the road. That's the chip seal operation. And on the nearer side of the road, you can see as part of the preparation in advance of that chip seal, Cape Seal process, we did crack sealing. So that would be what we're referring to when we're talking to surface treat prep. Hasn't been a lot of research done on the topic of uh, life extension, longevity of this treatment, but I, I think probably the most exhaustive study I found was uh, a sharp study uh, commissioned by the Federal Highway Administration back in the 90s, and they did projects all over the U.S. and up into Canada, and the goal of the study was to determine this uh, affect service life, uh, and they define service life uh, as the point in time when the crack treatment reached 75% effectiveness. So in other words, if they, they sealed 100 lineal feet of crack, how long did it take before uh, 25 feet or more of that sealed crack was no longer sealed effectively? Either the, it had lost adhesion, the sealant had lost adhesion on one side of the crack or the other, or maybe it failed itself. And what they determined in that study uh, and, and I only looked at, there were multiple locations in different climates across the country. I only looked at the wet freeze climates and those for this study were in Iowa and in Ontario, Canada. And I only looked at over banded configurations because that's the vast majority of the, the type configuration that we do for our clients. And what I found from all the data in that study was that the transverse cracks, those are the working cracks. Uh, those are the toughest on a sealant because it has to, uh, stretch and, and shrink more because of the amount of movement in those cracks. What the study determined is those sealants uh, were 75% or more effective for about three and a half years, 42 and a half months. And the longitudinal cracks, which are generally non-working cracks, so uh, way less stressful on the sealant, they lasted quite a bit longer between seven and eight years. And I would say based on my observations, uh, that, that's pretty comparable to what we see here with our with our materials, our methodology, and uh, uh, our climate here in this region. The other study uh, that was done related to how much life extension crack sealing provides when it's done as prep work for a surface treatment. And this study was done by the National Center for Asphalt Testing, or NCAD as we refer to it, which is down in the Auburn, Alabama area. And they simply took uh, portions of road put the surface treatments on without doing crack seal as prep, and then took other portions of the road, 
uh, in similar condition did crack sealing ahead of the surface treatment. And then they compared the rate of decline of the pavements deterioration. And this is what they found. Uh, the results were very, very much dependent on the pre-existing condition of the pavement. Um, and the life extension associated with the crack seal became more on better pavement. So they did both crack sealing and crack filling. And Matt's going to uh, share with you the difference between those two terms here in a bit. And what they determined was that um, the range in life extension that was attributable to just the crack seal alone. Now, this is not the surface treatment. Just the crack seal alone is prepped for the surface treatment ranged from about a, a year and a half to two years. And this is a, a relatively recent study. It was published just a couple of years ago in the, the NCAT newsletter. The thing that I want you to think about, though, is uh, this, this study was done in a wet, non-freeze region down in Alabama. So, yeah, they have the same moisture issues that we have, but they don't have the freeze-thaw issues that we have. So I think if this same study was done up here in our region, those life extension numbers would be even higher because we know when we get water down into our pavements, the destruction happens a lot, a lot quicker than it would in a, a non-freeze climate. So I think here in the Northeast is probably two, three, maybe even four years additional life extension that you get by just doing the crack sealing ahead of the surface treatment. So very, very important to do that. So now that's now that we've covered why we crack seal, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Matt Tito. Matt is our quality control manager. Uh, been in the asphalt industry for a long time, both on the uh, emulsion side, pavement preservation side, and the hot mix side of the industry. And he's going to share with you information on methods and materials, as well as key aspects of quality control programs and crack seal jobs. Matt, can you hear us okay? Hey, I can. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. And uh, if you don't mind advancing my slides as we go, that would be very appreciated. Sure. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for the next few minutes, I'm going to attempt to give you uh, a little bit of knowledge on cracks and crack sealants and hopefully not put you to sleep. Um, so before we start filling and sealing cracks, uh, it helps to know what kind of cracks we have so that we can use the proper material and methods to treat them. Um, pavement cracking can be broken down into working cracks and non-working cracks. Next slide, please, Dan. Uh, those working cracks are those that move more than one eighth of an inch per year. Now that doesn't sound like much, but this is uh, what they consider the minimum amount of movement. Working cracks can actually move up to one inch over the course of a year, going through a 100% change in width from winter to summer. So as you can imagine, sealing a crack that moves that much will pose a challenge, uh, but sealing it is critical to extending the life of your pavement. Uh, you know, as Dan had mentioned before, picture your half inch wide crack in the summer, and then it grows to an inch wide in the winter. Um, so now picture all of that debris in the winter being forced into that one inch crack during, uh, during you know, driving time and winter months and plowing. And then when the weather gets warm, that crack will narrow back up to that half inch original width. But, uh, but there's a problem there because that space is now packed so full of debris, the pavement has nowhere to go. Um, and those brittle crack edges just crumble under the stress. Now, if we repeat that process four or five times, it's pretty easy to see how your roads are going to deteriorate so rapidly. Um, transverse cracks are almost always working cracks. Next slide, please. Um, your non-working cracks are those that move less than one eighth of an inch per year, um, and their width grows very slowly. So while these cracks can also become plugged with debris, uh, the fact that they move so slow and so uh, throughout the year limits the stress that's placed on the surrounding pavement. Um, these cracks still need to be filled uh, or sealed to limit water intrusion and preserve your surrounding pavement. Um, block cracks, which you see here on the left, uh, those tend to form with age as the pavement oxidizes and gets brittle through, uh, you know, through oxidation and under traffic load. Um, longitudinal cracks, like at paving joints, are usually non-working cracks as well. Next slide, please. Um, other examples of the non-working cracks, like we said, the longitudinal cracks. Um, edge cracks, which form along the unconfined edge of pavement, uh, fatigue cracks, which uh, shown here in the photo on the left, those are referred to as uh, also alligator cracks. Um, these form as a result of structural failure within or beneath the pavement. Um, you can treat them, but we need to be careful. Um, so if we just paint that entire area with crack sealant, we can create a skid issue um, and possible tracking and pickup issues just due to the amount of massive amount of sealant in one spot. Um, so we'll provide some recommendations on how to deal with that here in a little bit. Next slide. 
Um, so treating your cracks falls into two basic categories. We have crack filling and crack sealing. And while some people kind of use these terms interchangeably, they are different processes and they use different materials. The easiest way to, uh, that I keep them straight is to remember the S in crack sealing, and that would stand for specialized materials that's applied as a structural treatment. Um, the sealant's designed to prevent water intrusion and last a very long time, even under high levels of movement. Crack filling, on the other hand, uses ordinary material like PG binders, uh, cold pour emulsions and cutbacks, uh, sand asphalt mixes and others. Um, these materials will reduce the infiltration of water and keep debris out, uh, but they're not suitable for cracks that move a lot. Next slide, please. So we have cracks, we know that, and we know that fillers and sealers exist, but uh, what should we use and how do we apply it? Um, so for the purposes of discussion here, we're gonna focus on the sealants. Uh, crack fillers are considered temporary treatment, so there's not a whole lot to discuss. Um, and for our sealants, we need something that can stand up to the uh, variety of stresses that we show here um, and continue to perform year after year. Next slide. Um, for our non-working cracks, um, aside from fillers, a, you know, if you really want a sealant on them, and we do recommend a sealant, basic applied, uh, hot applied PG binder dosed with polyester fibers will work very well to prevent water intrusion. Um, and it will hold up to the abuse of traffic and plows. And while I mentioned that PG binder itself was considered a filler, uh, the addition of the fibers gives us a tensile strength and a little bit of stretch, uh, and it makes it behave a lot more like a sealant with those fibers in it. And for your working cracks, uh, a PCRM with polyester fibers is more appropriate. PCRM stands for polymer and crumb rubber modified uh, crack sealant. And it's been specially formulated by our manufacturer to perform in New England's highly variable climate. Um, the SBS polymer provides us with tons of stretch, and that crumb rubber also adds some elasticity, but it provides a great deal of high temperature stability. Um, and of course, we've already discussed what the fibers do. Um, and these two products, the PG with fibers and the PCRM, are, are very good for cracks that are one-eighth to inch and a half wide. Uh, for anything wider than that, we recommend you use a mastic. Next slide, please. So speaking of mastics, um, Mastics, they've been around for a while, but they don't get a whole lot of love. Uh, they combine a highly modified asphalt rubber material with crushed aggregate. Um, so they're kind of a marriage between like a, a liquidy hot mix and crack sealant. Um, they are great for wide cracks and for pavement that's cracked around manholes and catch basins because you can apply it in a nice little ribbon around those structures and feather it out and, you know, kind of kind of pitch it up and keep everything closed. Um, and they're also really good for alligator cracks in heavily distressed areas and even for filling potholes. Um, and speaking of alligator cracks, and we also had mentioned before, there are other ways to treat them. So mastics is a very good way. If you really want to crack seal those areas, um, what we suggest is doing a picture frame around it. So kind of just a border around the distressed area, maybe a couple of you know strips through it on the biggest cracks uh, to keep everything in place. But again, you don't want to paint the area. Um, you can treat it with a mastic because the aggregate provides skid resistance. Um, but uh, you have to be very careful treating the sealant. Next slide, please. So we've identified our cracks, uh, we've picked a sealant, and now comes the important part, how are we gonna apply it? Um, application styles fall into four categories. You've got your flush fill, overband, reservoir, and combination. Now flush fill is good for those areas where you don't want any material on the surface. Uh, the downside here is you don't have the added protection of an overband if your flush filled sealant pulls away from a crack side. Um, that one eighth inch thick overband really improves the longevity of the sealant and really helps keep the water out. Uh, a reservoir configuration requires routing the crack with a crack router. Um, this removes brittle material along the edges of the crack and allows you to establish a consistent crack width and depth. And then following that, if you advance my slide, please. Um, so for the reservoir, you can add an overband. So kind of like the flush fill and overband, we have a reservoir and overband, and that's a combination treatment. Um, and that gives you a very high level of sealant performance, but it comes at a price. And it's a pretty significant price just due to all the extra labor involved in doing that. Is there enough improvement in performance to justify this cost? Um, that can be debated. What we know is there's miles and miles of cracked roads out there, um, and we'd rather see our customers apply a cost-effective material with proven performance um, to as many miles as possible um, so that you can preserve your investment. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that we all, we all need to buy a car, but very few of us can afford a Ferrari. So 
you know, we buy something within our budget that performs just about as well. Um, and as a picture at the bottom reminds us, the best crack sealant in the world with the best, uh, you know, the best materials is not going to perform to your expectations if we cut corners on preparation and application. Next slide, please. So as with any treatment out there, there have been failures along the way. Um, but don't let those failures that someone remembers on some job 15 years ago keep you from using this treatment. Um, we've learned a lot over the years, and we found that adhering to some basic best practices can prevent these problems from occurring. Um, and we've got some common issues here on this slide. Uh, next one, please. So your adhesion failures, those are primarily, primarily the result of poor crack cleaning, um, applying when the pavement is damp or cold, or when the sealant temperature is too low. We can greatly improve performance by making sure we blow those cracks out with a hot air lance. Um, not only does the hot air lance get that crack clean with the, you know, the high velocity compressed air, but it dries the crack walls and heats that surrounding pavement. Um, and that enables the sealant to penetrate that crack fully and get nice good adhesion before it starts to cool. Um, and I can't stress this enough, applying sealant at the manufacturer's recommended temperature is very important, critically important. If any cold material is added to your kettle during your operation, you really need to wait until that minimum temperature is reached again before you resume sealing operations because you're just asking for a failure if you don't. So now moving to cohesion failures, that's when the crack sealant itself fails. Uh, it'll pull away from itself. It adheres to the wall, but you can see it has torn as the crack moves. And you can mitigate this uh, by using a sealant designed for the conditions that you're placing it in. Um, and if you're routing, creating a reservoir of the correct depth and width for your sealant. In our cold climate, wide and shallow reservoirs perform better uh, than you know, deep, narrow ones. And remember, we don't want to seal cracks wider than an inch and a half. Um, I know we do it. I've seen it done out there because somebody just said, hey, just fill it up. Um, if you're seeing a lot of cohesion failures in your wider cracks, you should really consider using a mastic. And then lastly is the, the big one that kind of gets unsightly and gets us some phone calls is, tracking and pickup. Um, and that can be due to a number of factors. And it's important to remember that when we say traffic load, it doesn't always mean highway traffic, you know, so slow moving cars in a very busy mall parking lot on a hot summer day can create a nightmare for everyone um, if the wrong type of sealant is used. And for these kind of conditions, we recommend at a minimum PCRM um, or one of the nice asphalt rubber sealants that come prepackaged that conform to ASTM D6690. Uh, you want something heavy duty in that application. Um, so, but no matter what you use and under what application and for what cracks, uh, you always want to make sure that you cool this stuff off fully before opening it to traffic. Um, and you definitely want to consider, we highly recommend using a detacking agent. There's some very nice liquid ones out there that really, really help with the pickup issues. Uh, so I thank you for your attention. Thanks for your patience. As I ramble about cracks and treatments, um, I'll pass it back to Dan, who's uh, going to show us how Indus continues to separate itself from the competition. Thank you very much, Matt. A super job laying out some stuff that I think sometimes we don't pay enough time or attention to. That was, that was very well done. So, so Matt's covered the importance of different materials and methodologies and proper installation procedures. Uh, the next thing we'd like to do with you is take you to a job. And as I said earlier, we'd hope to do it live. Uh, too many impediments to doing it live. So we've got a video here. Uh, let's see if we can make the video play. And, and on the video, what we have is uh, uh, our client services manager, Art Baker. And Art's going to be interviewing Jay Bertowitz, who's our crack ceiling superintendent. In the peak of the season, we have 12 crack crews out working. And uh, Jay oversees all 12 of those crack crews. Each crew has a foreman on them, but Jay's the superintendent overseeing uh, those 12 crews and working with those 12 foremen. So let's see if we can make the video play here, Ryan. You ready? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending our webinar. Uh, I'm Art Baker with Indus, and I'm joined here today uh, with my colleague, Jay Bertowitz. Uh, Jay is our crack seal uh, superintendent with 21 years experience doing crack seal work for us. And I thought we'd uh, let everyone understand what happens uh, in our yard before we actually get out to a project. And so I'll turn it over to Jay to let him explain what's going on behind us. Here we see the process of filling a crack truck. We have two different types of material, a PCRM and a PG. They're about to throw the fibers. We have a polyester fiber. We're gonna put 8% in each truck. There's an agitator spinning inside the tank, which is gonna mix it. 
Tomorrow morning, two hours before their shift, they're going to fire off the truck to get the material hot, so they're hot and ready to go on the job. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, yesterday we learned about the batching of the material that happens in the yard as well as the preheating of the material and also the loading of the propane um, that we'll learn about a little bit more this afternoon. Uh, but t today we're back with Jay and he's going to let us know what actually happens now that we're out on the job getting the truck ready to actually go out onto the road and start crack sealing. So we're starting out the process of blowing out the cracks with our hot air lance. He's going to clean the debris, any moisture, and the vegetation from any and all of the cracks. Back here, we're going to start sailing. He's using a three-inch dish, and he's going to fill and leave a three-inch overband on the said cracks. And behind him, we're going to spray with a DTAC solution, blends oil, and that's going to prevent cars from getting material on their tires. And we also have traffic control watching traffic to make sure no one drives over it, to keep traffic off the material. All right, Jay, we previously mentioned, um, you know, a tow behind kettle operation versus the in-dust crack seal truck. Talk to us a little bit about the differences between those two operations. Well, the biggest difference our, is our unit is self-contained, so we don't have to fill. We have 1,095 gallons on board. We can go all day. A typical tow behind melter is usually three to 400 gallons. So they would have to stop every hour or so to fill. So you're losing time of the day. And it typically takes 15 to 20 minutes to fill it. So add that up in the course of an eight hour day. And it's, you know, another big part of that is as they add material in the, in the tow behind kettle operation, it changes the temperature in that kettle. So typically they need to wait, you know, up to an hour in order for the temperature to, to get back to the specified uh, material temperature. Jay, let's go into a little bit more detail on the traffic control needs for the operation, depending on what type of road you're working on. So typically in a neighborhood like this, we don't necessarily need traffic control. If we do have one or two, it will be for the residents if there's any issues. On busier roads, we'd have two, one in front and one in back of the operation, and we'd stop traffic in front, in and back, and send them down one lane. And also the person in back would stay back far enough to keep people off the material long enough for it to cure, which is typically a couple for minutes? A couple minutes, yeah. We want them back about 125 feet, if possible, which is usually the length of one telephone pole. Perfect. Thank you guys, that, that was great. Uh, I'm sorry we weren't, we weren't able to go out live to the job this morning and tie in to the webinar, but that, that was well done. Um, I, think, I think our uh, audience appreciate, appreciates those that haven't been out on a crack seal job. I think they appreciate the opportunity to go out there. So next up, we would like to introduce to you one of our crack seal clients. And this is Kevin uh, McCabe, who is a recently named public works director for the town of Dover, Massachusetts, just west of Boston. And we've had the pleasure of working with Kevin uh, in two other communities. He was on the pavement management team for the city of Newton when we first met him seven or eight years ago. And then until just the last year or so, he was over working in the town of Sudbury, also running the pavement management program there. And Kevin really is a, an up and rising, up and coming star in the public works business. And he's paying special attention to pavement management because he understands how pavements are such a valuable part of the infrastructure assets he's managing for his community. Uh, he's gonna be interviewed today by my colleague, my Indus colleague, Alan Bile, and Alan's been uh, the gentleman from Indus who has worked with Kevin for those seven or eight years. So uh, I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you for joining us and hey, go ahead, Alan. Thanks, Dan. Well, Kevin, a couple of questions. How long have you been in public works and fill us in a little bit about your current position, what your responsibilities are. Hi, Alan. Uh, yeah, so I've been in public works for a little over six years now. I uh, first served uh, City of Newton as a construction inspector, so more on the inspection side of uh, preservation and overseeing the type of work. Uh, most recently, for the last four years, I was with serving as the director of operations for the town of Sudbury, whereas, uh, you know, I was more on the implementation uh, and, and treatment selection side of things. And and currently uh, just started here in March uh, in Dover, Mass as their public works director. So 
Uh, well, Kevin, tell us a little about your history of using Crack Seal. Is it an important part of your program and do you do it yearly? Absolutely. So every year, uh, every part of my public works career, um, starting back in Newton, uh, I've had played a part in, in preservation uh, in our pavement management Rolodex. Um, unfortunately, they don't do any, they just do mill and fill in Dover. Um, so I'll have the opportunity here to work with, you know, the operations superintendent and incorporate more of a robust uh, pavement management program here. Excellent. And, and in your previous uh, two towns and uh, what materials have you used and is there a specific reason you use that material? So I've always used the uh, PCRM. So polymer and crumb rubber modified fibers uh, and, and, you know, both Sudbury and, and Newton, we had great success with that, with longevity and, and product. Uh, great. What do you consider important expectations from the contract to doing the, the work for you? Well, certainly quality is in the essence of, you know, the, the crews that you're provided and materials, uh, but scheduling and delivery on that schedule is definitely <laughs> Uh, from a, a public works uh, standpoint there and disseminating that information and, you know, robocalls and all that sort of thing. And when, when and where we're going to be there, um, you know, in, in both communities, we've done night work. So that, that would probably be one of the, the, the more important sides of it for sure. That's very important to all of us. Um, have you used crack seal in conjunction with other surface treatments? Yeah. So the, the spec that I used and incorporated in Sudbury, I used it, um, in conjunction with uh, cape sealing and um, uh, micro servicing. Uh, the spec there, I had uh, crack sealing incidental to the square yardage of the micro servicing. So very, you know, uh, along with the patchwork, a very important part of sealing up those cracks and sealing up those, those permanent patches before, uh, you know, using that other treatment. Understood. How long after crack sealing do you consider using an, an additional surface treatment? I think the rule of thumb that I've always stood by would be three years. Uh, and you could follow that up, you know, with a fog sealer or a micro service, depending on the, the road and, and how new it is. So, no. That's an, and one final question here, Kevin. What value do you place on crack sealing as compared to other treatments? I would say it has to be the highest. Um, it's the most cost effective preservation option uh, that's simply out there. Yep. So, you know, in, in the, you know, being a municipal leader and trying to spend the constituents uh, dollars and in, in to, to do the most road work, it, it certainly is, a you know, it's, it's one of the folds in a Swiss Army knife that needs to be, uh, I personally think, incorporated in everyone's pavement management. Excellent. Should, should be noted, Kevin is one of the young professionals in APWA, and it's professionals like these and leaders like these that we want leading us in the pavement preservation world. Thank you, Kevin, and we're going to turn it back over to Mr. Panod. Yes, thank, yeah, you. thank you both. Th thank you, uh, Kevin and Alan. And I think uh, Kevin told me he's just 30 years old. Is that right, Kevin? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> so for you to be a director, I think I became a director when I was 33, and I thought that was too young. And for you to be a director at 30, I think is a, it's a real testament to how dedicated you are to this public works profession. And I just always enjoy talking with you about pavement management because uh, not every public works director or public official is, is dialed into the importance of pavement management as you are. So I think your, your taxpayers, your constituents in Dover are very lucky to have you on the team there. Uh, <laughs> Thank thanks. You. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Thanks again for joining us today. Absolutely. So, so um, before we wrap up our uh, formal part of our presentation today and, and try to answer as many of your questions as we can, really, I, I just wanted to share some of the ways that I think Indus is different than some other contractors out there doing crack sealing. And in one word, I think really it's workmanship. Uh, I've been around crack sealing for 30 years now, and I've never seen better crack sealing workmanship than the crews here at Indus do. And I may be biased, but I think when you compare the work that uh, our crews are doing, it, it really shows the pride they're, they're putting into their, to their jobs. And, and in construction, you know, we know workmanship boils down to these three construction inputs, right? It's materials, equipment, and labor, or I'd rather call it people. Um, and, and let's break it down for you one by one. You've heard us throw around this acronym a lot today, uh, PCRM, which stands for Polymer and Chrome Rubber Modified Sealant. 
Uh, you saw Jay and his crew uh, adding all those polyester fibers when they were batching the material in the yard. We were up around 8% polyester fibers. And as Matt spoke to, that sealant performs very, very well across the broad temperature range that we experience here in the Northeast and all that crack movement. Uh, if I went back to being a public works director tomorrow in this region, there's no doubt I would specify that material. It's absolutely the best and best suited material, I think, for the area. And, and what can you say about our trucks? You know, it's a, it's a point of pride for us here at Indus, our, our fleet. And uh, when, when I think that we actually custom build these trucks ourselves, we buy the chassis and we uh, put together the entire back end of that truck. Um, aside from the pride that we get from building it ourselves, it, it gives us a couple of advantages that uh, for our clients and the quality of the work that we do. First on the front end of the truck is the, the, the blow pipe uh, with also a, a, a hot air lance that's fed by propane, a propane tank mounted on the truck. What that allows us to do is clean those cracks out thoroughly and preheat them to get the, the most life we can out of the sealants. If you put a sealant into a crack that's not cleaned out or dried out, it's not gonna perform as well. Um, I'll drive through job sites with some other contractors and I'll see uh, workers out there using backpack leaf blowers to clean out the cracks, no hot air lance. And it's just, it's night and day different from uh, this truck and, and our crews and the way they do work. And the other big differentiator is that huge melter kettle on the back of the truck. As Jay mentioned in his comments, uh, I think it's 1,095 gallons. It's over 1,000 gallons. So these crews are showing up on your job every day with uh, almost a thousand gallons or a little over a thousand gallons of material all heated up, mixed up, blended with fibers and ready to go. And they can keep that temperature consistent all day long. If a contractor shows up with a small tow behind melter and they range in size from, I don't know, 250 to 400 gallons, somewhere in that range, then they typically have to feed new coal blocks of material into that melter throughout the day. Um, and then there's a tendency to maybe not wait for all of those blocks to totally melt down and get up to temperature. So you've got a, a tremendous amount of inconsistency of the temperature of material coming out of the wand and that leads to poor quality, uh, lesser lasting sealants. Uh, these trucks uh, are, are suited for a full day's worth of material kept up to temperature. And then last but not least, in fact, I think is most important because no matter how good the materials you're working with, no matter how fancy the trucks you built are, if you don't have the right people, you're not gonna get a great job. And I think we have the best people in the industry. And some of the reasons I think that we have the best people in the industry, uh, let's start with experience. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 12 of these crews that Jay Bertowitz oversees as their superintendent, each with their own foreman. And the range of experience of those 12 foremen is from five to 27 years with an average of just over 14 years of experience. Uh, those are the kind of people I want doing my crack seal, not somebody that just heard about it or started doing it uh, this year. Not only have they done a lot of crack sealing, but they've also shown theirs and Indus's commitment to ongoing and continual learning. And the way they've shown that is that they've, a large number of them have become certified by AASHTO. There has been a trend in the pavement preservation industry going back, oh, probably about seven years ago now. I think we first had our, our, had our first group of people certified in early 2017. Uh, what happened was AASHTO, which is, which is an association of the of 50 state DOTs, they partnered with the National Center for Pavement Preservation at Michigan State University, and they started putting together uh, courses, training courses, for each preservation treatment. They've got them for crack treatment, they've got them for slurry systems, they've got them for chip sealing thus far. Um, so hours and hours of hours in training, and then to get certified, you actually have to take and pass an exam with a score of at least 70%. So this isn't sit in a class and get a certificate and you're certified, it's learn, 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 and then take an exam to show your competency. Um, I think it's a good step forward to raise the bar in our industry. And I think Indus has, has become a leader in this certification movement uh, across the country. In fact, I went to the TSP2 website uh, day before yesterday to see the current numbers. There were 
48 folks certified for crack treatment, 15 of them were our Indus employees. So I think that shows you how dedicated we are to raising the bar in our industry. And then lastly is commitment. You know, we, we at Indus are very, very committed to our clients' success. If they're not successful, we're not successful. And, and that, that philosophy, that care and, and attention to our clients' success uh, is not just us guys in the sales and marketing department. It's really all the people that work here, including these guys on the crew. They know that if you're not happy with the job they do today, uh, you're probably not going to want to have them back next year. So it's important for them to come out, do a good job, uh, get to earn your trust, earn your repeat business and make you look good so that we all look good together and maintain our roads at the lowest possible cost. So that's why I think Indus is a little different than other crack treatments. And that's the, the material that we put together for you today. Uh, we hope you found it helpful, useful, uh, informative. Um, and now what we'd like to do is answer any questions that uh, you may have come up with today or came to the webinar with. So I think, uh, Art, are you gonna field the questions for us? Yes, yes, we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one came in a little bit early, but and, and Matt covered it somewhat, but maybe you wanna expand a little bit on it, Dan. And the, the question was simple, is routing worth it? Oh boy, that, that's a good question. I, I think it, <laughs> our stock answer, I think it depends. If I was maintaining an interstate highway in a very busy area, I think I would spend the money routing at least those transverse working cracks, the one that Matt explained have so much movement associated with them, um, at least those. And I don't think I would do the longitudinal not working cracks at the local level. And again, that's how I got started in this business myself back in the 90s as a public works director. I chose not to there because I was operating on a typical local shoestring budget for pavement management. I, I didn't have any extra money to, to, to go above and beyond, which I think routing sort of is. So I chose not to route at the local level and put my money into the ceiling. And I, to be honest, I didn't see a lot of failure in those transverse working cracks. But if that had been an interstate highway, I probably would have spent the money on routing. I, I don't know, Matt, what would your opinion be on that? Uh, similar opinion, Dan. Um... You know, again, it's just, it comes down to disruption of the traffic um, versus the performance versus the cost. And I, I think um, where some towns have such a hard time getting away from, you know, as, as Kevin McCabe had said, that Dover's all mill and fill. It's just mill and fill. Um, mm -hmm. And where towns have a hard time diverting any money to any of these other treatments, especially crack sealing. Um, I really think you need to just get out there and seal as much as you can with a with a with something that's going to perform like the PCRM, um, you know, and, and just kind of attack it from that way. Yeah, if you, if you've got the unlimited budget, great, and go ahead and, and route. But I, you know, I have yet to find a, a municipality or even the state DOT that where the budget's unlimited. So, thanks. Great. Uh, next question, another good one. What are methods for estimating the amount of gallons needed? The unit cost is in square yards. So how do you calculate the gallons from the square yards? I'm going to let you answer that, Arthur. You've probably done that a lot more than I have. Yeah. So, you know, typically what we'll do is we'll go out and measure how many lineal feet of crack that you have. And depending on the extent and severity of those cracks, typically you can assume anywhere from 15 to 20 lineal feet per gallon for those wide cracks that are going to take a lot of material. And it can go as high as, you know, say 45 feet per gallon uh, on the finer cracks. So if you use that, that can get you uh, a pretty close estimate of, of how many gallons you need, um, depending on the number of lineal feet of crack. Now you might say, well, how the heck do I figure out how many lineal feet of cracks are in my road? So that answer to that question would be you go out and, and take a representative area of, of what you think, you know, say a 50 foot section of the road uh, that best represents the cracking level of the road. And you measure that square yard, so 50 feet long by whatever the width of the road is to get your square yards. And you apply that number of lineal feet of crack over the entire length of the road that you want to crack seal. And that'll give you a rough estimate of how many um, lineal feet of cracks you have. And then you can use that gallon application rate to figure out how many gallons. 
So that's, that, that's one Good method of doing it for sure. There's no exact way. <laughs> we'll make that clear right up front. Uh, it's really, really hard to get it exact. It is. Uh, next question we have is, uh, we have used a contractor that uses a tow behind kettle in the past. What is the best way to verify how much material they use? I think uh, what I've heard they do is they'll, they'll uh, keep track of the number of blocks put into the kettle over the course of the day. So they're gonna start the day with so many inches of material in their cylindrical kettle, just like we do with our truck. So we get a start of the day measurement and an end of the day measurement. And then we also add to that, however many blocks of material were thrown into the trucks. And I've heard some inspectors, you know, will actually ask the contractor to hang on to the boxes. Typically this stuff comes in a box and they just hang on to the empty cardboard boxes on the truck and they just count those up at the end of the day. That's one way I've heard of it. Have you guys heard of another way? No, I think that's typically how it's done, Dan. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of just wanted to reiterate the, as I'm looking at <laughs> the temperature gauge right here, it's very critical to maintain temperature. Um, you know, it, it might need a little bit of oversight, uh, even if it's just a day or two to let them know somebody's watching. But um, if they continually add blocks throughout the day, that's better than let the tank go dry and then add them all at once. So, um, but definitely make sure that temperature stays up as they get added. One, one thing you may want to consider there is it, my, my concern has always been with those tow behind mouthers. Every time you throw one of those cold blocks material and it's going around, there's an agitator inside the tank. So it's spinning around almost kind of like an ice cube going in a glass of water. So over time, that'll melt down. My concern is that colder material will make it down near the outlet port and end up going out through the wand uh, and into the crack. So a, a nice inexpensive way to make sure that the material is all uniformly up to temperature would be to have one of those thermal thermal uh, guns. What do, you, what do you call them, Matt? Uh, those temper measure? Uh, yeah, temper you me can, yeah, you can run a, a Inf infrared temper temperature gun. Infrared, yep. yeah, and just periodically get a feel for what the temperature is of the material coming out of the wand. How uniform is it? Uh, that's yes. pretty, a lot of people when they're paving, they use those to check the, the temperature of the hot mix material. It can be also used to check the temperature of the crack sealant, make sure it's uniform and consistent. Yeah, and, and that's another benefit to one of our trucks is we can run the agitator all the time. And, and, and as you know, we don't have to add material. So it's it just, leaves a much more uniform temperature profile throughout the whole tank. Great, and then the last question, um, you recommended PG binder with fibers and PCRM with fibers for non-working versus working. The truck only holds one type of sealant, so how does one choose which type is better for a project and are they similar in cost? I'll let you guys speak to the cost. Um, as far as use, it depends on, I guess, what your road looks like. Um, if you don't have a lot of working cracks, uh, maybe the PG and fibers is perfect for you. Um, if you have working cracks, I would, I would definitely recommend kind of kind of going with the PCRM. Yeah, th those those working cracks are going to be the real problem child out there, um, and I would definitely go ahead and make sure that you're going to cover those with the right material. But as far as cost, I'll let either Dan or Art uh, answer that one. Yeah, I'll just I'll just follow up Matt's comment saying that. Uh... You know, we, we don't typically, we, we certainly don't send two trucks out, one with PG and fibers and the other with PCRM and that would be inefficient. Um, most of our clients, you know, if you've got, as Matt said, some transverse cracks, you're going to want the PCRM sealant in those. So why not just use PCRM, the better material on all the cracks? I think it's about a oh two dollar a gallon premium. Art, does that sound about right to you? Yeah, I was going to say ten to fifteen percent. Um, typically, PCRM is a little bit more expensive than the PG and fiber. Ten to fifteen percent, so maybe even less than two dollars a gallon. Then. Yeah, so like a dollar a gallon. Is that yeah, dollar to two dollar. Okay, so not you know to me it's such small money in the big picture of most communities pavement management programs why scrimp on uh, to save that that little bit on the ceiling just use the better material on all the cracks that's what i would recommend great well that uh, there no other questions came in and it is uh, five after 12. 
Okay. Well, again, thank thank everybody uh, for attending. Thank uh, my fellow presenters for being a part of the production today. And we, we just hope it was informative. That's the reason we do these things is to share information we've collected. And we appreciate you joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you.